The types of loads acting on structures for buildings and other structures can be broadly classified as verticals, vertical loads, horizontal loads, and longi longitudinal loads. The vertical loads consist of dead load, lift load, and impact load. The horizontal loads comprises of wind load and earthquake load. The longitudinal loads, EA, tractive and braking forces are considered in a special case of design of bridges, gantry, girders, etc, etc, etc. So in this video we're gonna check on the types of loads on structure buildings and other types of structures. Greetings and salutations, I'm the architect Jesus Arroyo and this is Planos Constructivos, we're going to be talking about construction and everything related to it. And we're all, in this video we're going to talk about the types of loads on structure and buildings. In a construction of building, two major factors consider are safety and economy. If the loads are judged and taken higher than the economy is affected. If economy is considered and loads are taken lesser than the safety is compromised. So the estimation of various loads acting is to calculate it precisely. And pretty much one thing I talk about in my other videos is you know to do the minimum effective dose, which is so you don't have to spend a lot of money on extra structure elements and stuff like that. So what we're gonna talk about this on this time is um, pretty much uh, using the checking on the types of loads, so you can calculate or pretty much see what's affecting your structure. No? And the first of all is the dead loads, and the first vertical load is that is considered as a dead load. Dead loads are permanent or stationary loads, which is are transferred to structure throughout the lifespan of the building. Dead load is primarily due to self-weight of structural members, permanent partition, walls, fixed permanent equipments, and weight of different materials if majorly consists of weight of rooms, beams, walls, and columns, which are otherwise the permanent parts of the building. Also we call them vertical because you know pretty much they do due to gravity effects they tend to go you know down or vertical. So the calculation of dead loads of each a structure are calculated by the volume of each section and multiplied by the unit weight. Unit weights are some of the common materials um, are very known to architects and engineers and pretty much what they do is the calculation of each element so they can calculate the entire uh, structure and how it is pretty much made. Now the second one is the imposed loads or live loads. The second vertical load that is considered in the design of a structure is imposed loads or light loads. Light loads are neither either movable or moving loads without any acceleration or impact. These loads are assumed to be produced by the intended use or occupancy of the building, including weights or movable partitions or furniture, etc. etc. And light loads keeps on changing from time to time. These loads are to be suitable, assumed by the designer. It is one of the major loads in the design, and also the one with that we have to be extra careful because uh, you know uh, the more density of people you have on the building, the more you have to be careful and also you know add an extra. Uh, reinforcement to the to the structure. The minimum values of light loads to be assumed are given by the ES and any other you know uh, rules are also you know uh, legislations and it depends of the uh, you know it, it depends of the country very much what they do on the laws they have it. The code gives the values of light loads the following occupancy clef classifications and pretty much our residential buildings dwelling houses, hotels, hostels, boiler rooms and plant rooms, garages, and then our educational buildings. If you see the educational buildings have more density of people than 
sorry, <laughs> institutional buildings, assembly buildings, business and office buildings, mercantile buildings, industrial buildings, and storage rooms. The code gives uniformly distributed load as well as concentrated loads. The floor slabs have to be designed to carry either uniformly distributed loads or concentrated loads, whichever produce greater stresses in the pot under consideration. Since it's unlikely that any one particular time all floors will not be simultaneously carrying maximum, lo maximum load, the code permits some reduction in imposed loads in the signing columns, load bearing walls, piers, supports, and foundation. Some of the important values uh, are, you know, very common and known for engineers and architects and the, and the subject and pretty much, uh, however, in multi-storied buildings, chances of full imposed loads acting simultaneously, you know, it, it may change because the, the same building and different stories may not be as occup occupied as any other or at least a different story. Now when it comes to wind loads, it's primarily horizontal load caused by you know the movement of air re re relative, relative to earth. Wind load is required to be considered in a structural design, especially when the heat of the building exceeds two times the dimensions transverse to the exposed wind surface. For low rise buildings, say up to four to five stories, the wind load is not critical because the moment of resistance provided by the continuity of floor system to column connection and walls provided between columns are sufficient to accommodate the effect of these forces. You know, pretty much there are enough. And further, in limit state method, the factor for the sign load is reduced. And when the wind is considered as against the factor, you know, is 1.5 when the wear is not considered as 1.2. The horizontal forces exerted by the components of wind is to be kept in the mid while designing is the building. The calculation of wind loads depends on the two factors, namely velocity of the wind and size of the building, very much by momentum. In complete details of calculating wind load on structures, I given, you know. Um, Due to those factors, there is also you know a color code for when you design on on when, and also you know there is a lot of programs for for calculation of those structures, especially when you know tall buildings that they receive a lot of wind on on the sides, and also there is another load called you know the, the snow load. Uh, you know snow loads are especially constitute of vertical loads in the building but these types of loads are considered only in the snow you know when when snowfall places especially in mexico here where i live you don't have any snow at all uh, unless you live you know in a mountain or something like that you're not going to have a lot of snow so those snow loads are very much to be taken care of you know on places where the snow falls then there's another one which is the uh, the earthquake loads and the earthquake forces constitute to both vertical and horizontal forces on the building. The total vibration caused by the earthquake may be resolved into three mutually perpendicular directions, usually taken as vertical and two horizontal directions. The movement of in vertical direction do not cause forces in superstructure to any significant extent, but the horizontal movement of the building at a time of earthquake is so to be considered while designing you know when i say a horizontal or when i say vertical is because you know uh when an earthquake occurs you know it moves like this or it moves like this so it shakes differently and when it's vertical you know um it's not so much because the building is already designed for supporting vertical movement you know especially when, when you load it because all the all the load goes by gravity down. But when it comes to an earthquake, it's pretty much moving like this too. So those are called horizontal forces because you know it moves it like that, and the building is not so much designed for supporting that kind of mm, 
strength and that's why we had to take it to pretty much calculate that kind of strength the response of the structure to the ground vibration is a function of the nature of foundation soil size and mode of construction and the duration and intensity of ground motion and it gives detail of such calculations for structures standing on soil which will not considerably settle or slide appreciably due to the to an earthquake pretty much the seismic accelerations for the design might be arrived at from seismic coefficient which is defined as the ratio of acceleration due to earthquake and acceleration due to gravity from an analytic reinforcement concrete the structures located on the seismic zone two and three or you know there are very classification of seismic zones uh, and places you know where there are more than five stories highs and importance factor less than one and the seismic forces are not critical the higher the building you know there is a lot of more momentum on it and also you know if it's higher then it's gonna move easier so you're gonna be extra careful for that well another loads and effects and acting in stories you know as per in addition to the uh, to what I just discussed, accounts shall be taken of the following forces and effects and if they are liable to to affect materially the safety and serviceability of all the structure, you know, and those could be foundation movements, elastic actual, actual shortening, soil and fluid pressure, vibration, fatigue, impact, erection loads, stress concentration effect due to point load and those alike. Well, builders, I hope this has worked for you and has served you. Uh, my name is Jesus Arroyo, and if you want more videos like this, I know, excuse my English, I'm, let's say these are my first videos in English. Well, I hope this has served you well to all my builders and contractors, and we'll see you around and to give you more videos and, you know, topics related to construction and architectures please subscribe and also don't forget to hit on the bell so you can pretty much be notified when we have new videos thank you very much